Okay, can I get a show of hands of who here doesn't want to make more money? Yeah, it's about what I thought. Okay, a um, little background on me before we dive into this. I'm Corey Quinn. I'm awesome. I'm in the process of doing a fun employment thing for a few months to uh, decompress. And after that, I'm not entirely sure what's going to come next, but I'm going to figure it out. At, if you have an interesting idea in the management or ev in the evangelism space, please let me know. And I'd just like to point out the irony of saying that, uh, looking for people to hire you while you're giving a talk on how to make yourself more expensive. It sends an interesting message. Uh, I do want to talk, uh, specifically call out that this talk started life as a single slide in a talk I gave on interviews a few years back. And one of the things that made that interesting was that it was what people really tended to focus on. They cared quite a bit about how to get more money. So this talk doesn't talk about anything leading up to the point of getting an offer and doing the negotiation. This is not about skill development and how to become worth more. It is about how to wind up asking for what you're worth and negotiating for better outcomes. There are really two ways that you can go as far as getting more money. Um, the first is to ask for a raise where you currently are, and the other is to change jobs. This talk is focused entirely on changing jobs um, for two reasons. One, it is almost entirely environment specific, whether or not you'll be able to negotiate a raise or not. And two, if I want a 20% raise in a job I'm already in, I almost have to start taking hostages in order to pull that off. When I change jobs, that can happen as a matter of course. For better or worse, corporate loyalty in 2016 is a thing of the past. It's dead. There is no more, there really are no more jobs where you go and work somewhere for 25 years and retire with a gold watch and a pension. Those, that was once the case, it no longer is. So this idea of, well, I want to show loyalty to my employer, it's laudable, it really is. But it's also a little bit outmoded. You should stay where you are if you're happy and it makes sense for you to do so. If not, don't feel guilt about leaving. I talk to a lot of people who get hung up on that to some extent. It's also important from my perspective, as well as from a negotiation perspective, to continually be learning new things so you don't stagnate. It's depressing talking to someone who has been in the field for 20 years and doesn't have 20 years of experience. They have one year of experience that they repeated 20 times. I also want to point out that a lot of what I'm talking about is in a very general across the board sense. When you sit there and say, oh, that's not, uh, that, that's not the company I work at, you're probably right. This is, we're, we're catering for the 80% common case, not edge cases. There are special cases, for example, companies that wind up saying, we do not negotiate on offers, which is a negotiating position. So what are you worth? That's where it all starts from. And I am speaking specifically to a monetary sense, not an intrinsic value. Uh, someone who goes and works as a school teacher is going to provide far more intrinsic value to society than I ever will. But society does not view them in that way economically. That's a larger social problem. But when I say what, you're, what you are worth in a dollars and cents sense, that is not saying anything whatsoever as to your worth as a human being. It's about what the market will bear for your services. In fact, I was talking with people at a community conference recently where it was, it was mentioned by people at nonprofits, the best way for people to help causes that they care about, it, it makes you feel good to donate time and, or to wind up giving uh, goods or whatnot, but the number one thing you can do is generate money. From an op, from a optimization point of view, do the thing you're fantastic at, make embarrassing amounts of money, and then give it to the causes that you care about because they are perfectly optimized to help work for those causes rather than someone who winds up volunteering an hour or two here or there at a soup kitchen, for example. Okay, so what you're worth is arguably a lot more than many people think that it is. Um, Right now, especially in the DevOps space, salaries are skyrocketing. I, we've never seen them be this high, and every year they seem to get higher still. Um, what's, it, it's not necessarily something that is, this should not be a, revolution, a revelation to you, 
But more to the point, it's not a revelation to companies that are on the other side of this table. Um, companies have a very good panopticon level view of what the market is because they talk to a lot of candidates, they certainly know what everyone they employ make, and they have a very broad overview and a deep overview of what people make in different places. And this leads to a information and hence a power imbalance because they have a great idea on that. But what's interesting is if you, as you talk to each other and figure out and try to get uh, information about what people do, what people are doing at other companies, no one mentions how much they make. We have a taboo against it. The right to discuss your compensation with your peers is protected by the National Labor Relations Act, but people don't do it. It's considered a rude question. People find it uncomfortable to talk about. And this does serve the other side of the table very well. If you, don't, if you think you're worth 80,000 a year and the industry going right for what you're doing is 120, why would they necessarily rock that boat in many shops? It, it's working against their interest. It's also worth pointing out as well that you're more expensive than you probably think you are. Uh, if you hire an employee who earns a salary of $100,000, the cost to that company is closer to 150 grand by the time you wind up calculating in benefits, pay, uh, payroll taxes, and a few other things that tie into that. So you're more expensive than you probably think you are. And if you get into a point where you're starting to see that salaries are m worth more than you think you are, you're wrong. When you and the market disagree as to what your value in the marketplace is, you are invariably wrong in either direction. All of that said, at no point should you pick a job based on how much you're going to get paid. In the day-to-day -day work that you're doing, it is very hard to remember that, well, in two weeks I get a paycheck that's big and that makes it all worthwhile. Money does not buy happiness and it's not worth pursuing at the extent of all else for most people. But once you're doing something you love, you want to advocate for yourself as best you're able to. So in order to figure out what you're worth, it helps to figure out first what market rate looks like. Um, one trick that I've seen blow up in people's faces and you should never ever do is decide that today I'm going to go ask for a raise at my current job because I just found out that my peer makes more than I do. If you do that, you can't mention that as a reason why. If you say you should pay me more because Sarah makes more, that becomes a very different conversation and you don't present well. That's not really making a case. That is that's opening a conversation and taking it down a road where you're trying to argue just because it's, you're coming from a place of talking about fairness. That doesn't move hearts or minds. Instead, you should figure out what, you are, what your market rate is for the skill set you have, the experience you bring to the table, and the geographical market you're in. There are a few ways to do this. Uh, there's a talk pay movement on Twitter from time to time where people start posting salaries, sometimes anonymously, sometimes not. Glassdoor can give you a bird's eye overview and reaching out to people in a position to know. You'll see my Twitter handle in the bottom of all my slides. If you're curious, my DMs are open. If you'd like to know for your skill set what you're worth in the market in a general sense in a certain geography, let me know. If I don't know the answer, I'd be willing to bet I know someone who does. Additionally, when you take a look at various job offers as you go through this and start uh, stacking yourself up against them, remember that all job descriptions, even yours, are inherently aspirational. It's a shopping list. Well, I don't have the degree in the right thing, or I know Apache, not Nginx. You wind up in a very strange place. That's almost, a, it's almost irrelevant. By the time you're sitting down having the conversation, the written job description doesn't matter anymore. Now, as with so many things in life, timing is everything. When do you talk about money? The answer to that is as late in the process as is humanly possible. Not at the beginning of the conversation when you're just reaching out to them, not during the job interview. The time to talk money is as close to the offer as possible. And remember, the first person to name a number loses. And if it's you being the first person to name the number, there are three possible outcomes. You lose in all of them, but let's talk about how. 
Uh, let's pretend that there's a mythical company that wants to pay you $50,000 for the role. And whatever the role is, let's pretend that that is spot on accurate for the market. You don't know that that's what they're prepared to offer, and you're, there at, you're asked what you cost. Here's what you say. The first choice is you ask for 60. Holy crap, you're 20% too expensive. Get lost next, please. And at that point, you don't get to even have a conversation to justify why you're worth that much money if it's too early in the process. And it's unlikely that you'll ever know that this is why they wound up not responding to you. The second outcome is where you underbid. They want, they're willing to pay 50 grand for the role. You ask for 40. It should be pretty obvious how you lose on this one. And it's usually going to be framed by them in a phrasing such as, well, $40,000 is a bit of a stretch, but we really like you, so we think we can probably make that work. <laughs> good work. You, you feel very good about yourself for having just talked your way out of 10 grand a year. Now, to be fair, this is a generalization. Some companies will offer the 50 regardless, even if you lowball. I don't like to count on that. So let's pretend you nail it. You get it absolutely flawlessly. You got the number magically correct. First off, you're not going to know whether this is the $40,000 or the $50,000 situation, first off. And you're always going to wonder, as long as you work there, what would have happened if you had said 55? But what does it matter? It's only $5,000 a year. How does that matter? Well, that's $5,000 a year that a 5% raise next year is going to be based off of which in turn the year after that and the year after that, this compounds in big ways. Uh, the money you make now directly impacts bonus percentages in many companies, and it also in some cases will change the equation when you talk to next companies. So yeah, the first person to name a number loses. Now the challenge, of course, is when they ask that question that we all dread answering. So what's your current salary? The honest answer here is none of your freaking business, but I would not suggest framing it that way. <laughs> this is the socially accepted one free pass that the company winds up getting at screwing you over. And we are, we've come to accept this as what we do. And now we start the back and forth dance. Well, I don't normally disclose that information. Or I'm more interested in the specifics of the role. Let's figure out if it's a fit and later we can talk about money. That's my usual initial response to that. Some places accept this, and that, that's, that's reasonable. Some places don't. If you are in a point where you have to give a number to move forward and you're not willing to walk away over it, some people are, some people are not in a position to do that, and I'm not going to judge you for it, you don't want to lie. It is too easy to do a reference check and later with HR. And we have a number, we have a compensation figure of this. Is that accurate? They say no, you're in, a, you're in trouble. So you don't lie. It's, I usually like to come up and even, I, I make one last ditch approach here. And here's the way I tend to frame it, is I'm looking for offers around X, but I'm willing to come down from that number for the right fit. And X should be embarrassingly high. Because what you've just said, is, with all respect, is, yeah, I am pants-shittingly expensive. But if you sell me, I might not be. You've at least framed the conversation really high. Sometimes that's still not enough, and they keep pushing. So be honest, but it doesn't mean you have to be naively honest. If backed into a corner, I will give a number, but I will never use the word salary. I'll use the word compensation instead. And there's a few different ways I think of compensation. Uh, try and keep all of these things. Note that all of these are cash-based. It's nice to get free catered lunch every day at a company, but it's not nearly as defensible as this list. So. Mention it on a list of perks. Like, well, yeah, we have, uh, we have free lunch twice a week. We have uh, free soda in the break room. We have running water, and it's awesome. Yeah, it... <laughs> don't ever, ever talk down your current benefits. Because whatever your current health plan is, for example, it's going to be far better than whatever they've got. That's the story, and it's impossible to do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison anyway. 
You can also consider things when you're talking to companies as well down the road that you, if they can't move on numbers necessarily, they're often very willing to talk about non-traditional forms of compensation. Um, your vacation time has value. There's a whole separate rant on the idea of unlimited vacation, because it's never unlimited. That's guilt-based management. Um, but there are other perks you can negotiate for. Can I work from home one or two days a week? Can I build a laptop out of coconuts and work from that beach a few days a week? Read it as the rest of my life. Does, and there are other, for other perks as well. For example, does your office have a foosball table? I find those things horrifying in an office environment, but some people like that. There are forms of compensation that do not have a price tag attached to them. So let's talk for a second about recruiters. <laughs> That's Jill from the keynote this morning. Now, I was sitting way in the back, so it was hard to see what she looked like, but I'm almost positive she's the one on the left. Jill, Jill's one of two kinds of recruiters. There are internal recruiters and external recruiters. Um, the way that this works is with an external recruiter, not Jill, you can be very honest and skip this entire dance. Tell them what you make now and what you're looking for. They will correct, and they are incentivized the same way that you are. If you don't get a job, if you don't get an offer, they don't get paid. And the way external recruiters are compensated is on a percentage of your annual salary. You are aligned, let them help you. They do this a lot more than you do. The latter, the, the internal kind, however, unfortunately, tends to be acting as an agent of the company and in the company's best interest. So sadly, at this time, I'm sorry, Jill, you're not to be trusted. Well, thank you, thank you. So this sort of does tie into the talk I originally wanted to give, but doesn't work as well as a standalone, uh, which is effectively, screw you, pay me, why equity is worthless. And when I say equity, I do want to qualify that as equity in the form of stock options in companies that are not public. This is almost always what you will get in startups. And it is effectively different than other forms of equity. If, you're, if your company offers you stock grants or RSUs or cash equivalent of some kind that doesn't depend on the company having an exit event, then knock yourself out. But startup options are, should be evaluated at zero. There are a few reasons for that. For every successful startup that you've heard about, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitter, sort of, there are thousands upon thousands that you have never heard of because they failed. This is called the survivorship bias. We remember the successes because we've never heard of the failures. You've never heard of Twitter for pets because you've never heard of them because they went out of business before they would be in a position where you would have heard of them. It turns out, Get this, there was a slight flaw in their business model. Dogs don't tweet as much as you'd think. <laughs> so before you wind up devoting four years of your life to a startup, it's important to understand both that they do have a business model, as well as that your equity is nowhere near as valuable as they are telling you it is. But let's set that aside. You've taken an offer, you've been given, I don't know, a quarter of a percentage of uh, the company of Twitter for Pets. You've been there, yay. Here's what they don't tell you. Assuming you beat the odds, which are already 70% of companies, startups, give or take, will never be able to turn that into anything whatsoever. So let's assume you've already beaten those odds and you're ahead. Um, let's pretend that this is not going to, you might, let's just even pretend you're working for the next Google, but spoiler, you're not. The odds are astronomical against it. But during this process, you wind up with your, your shares getting diluted with every successive round. So there's more money in the pot, but your slice just became a lot smaller. Founder shares tend to get paid out before employee shared. It's got common versus preferred stock. Liquidation preferences mean that some of the investors get more out than they invested in because of how these things were, uh, were calculated out. Down rounds, as in you take a lesser valuation to raise more money, and that blows, that blows everything up. Your cap table looks ridiculous. And whatever is left after all of that ideally goes to you. Enjoy the scraps. Even that's not guaranteed. At Zynga, they, this, this uh, made the news about four or five years ago when they were about to go public. 
they did a clawback from existing employees. They have to return on vested shares because they thought they were given too much equity or they would be fired. That's an edge case, but it happened. Oh, and if you lose this job, for example, you generally have 90 days in most cases to exercise any equity that you've, uh, that, that you've invested in. So at that point, you've got to come up with cash to buy the equity, which is still a crapshoot because the future is not guaranteed and you're not there anymore. There may very well, depending on how long you've been there, be tax consequences to this. Oh, and you don't work there anymore. Maybe it was your choice, maybe it wasn't, but it may very well be that you don't have a job. Now is the time to spend money on investing? Some companies are fixing this, like Pinterest, for example, is going either seven or 10 years after you leave to wind up having the option to exercise, which is better, but that's still the, excep the exception rather than the rule. Let's also not forget that the Uber problem still tends to exist. They have north of a $60 billion evaluation. Very early employees there are damned near billionaires on paper, and they can't leave without incurring a seven to eight figure tax bill. And they can't liquidate what they've got, not easily, not without some serious agreement and negotiating on the backside. And it sounds on some level like a nice problem to have, but they've been there for, in some cases, for almost 10 years. Some people don't want to stay in the same place that long. They wanted to join a small, scrappy startup. It is now massive. And some people want to do different things. And sure, it's nice, well, why do you stay? Because I'll never have to work again if we ever exit. But it's not guaranteed. A gilded cage is still a cage. And their CEO has even gone on record recently saying he doesn't plan to go public for another 10 years, possibly. Sounds awesome. I'm also not trying to disparage the fine founders of Twitter for Pets, or your founders, but the venture capital investor on the other side of the negotiating table does more deals like this in a month than the founder will in their entire life. And frankly, people are better at negotiating these deals than anyone in this room is at doing the DevOps. And think about what you could do for the Twitter for Pets infrastructure if there were a few hundred million bucks at stake. That's how they view this. They spend enormous piles of money in the hopes of getting massive returns. So if you're offered equity, yes, I would take it. Why not? It's fun to buy a lottery ticket. But don't ever trade that for a meaningful salary. This is not to dissuade people from working for startups. There are valid and fun reasons to do it. If you love the culture, go for it. But don't work for nothing. Don't substitute equity for salary. It's icing on the cake. It's not the entire cake. You're gambling enough risk on, that, on, your, on this employer that you shouldn't be wanting to take on additional risk. If they go out of business, your investments have tanked, and you have wind, you want, you're on the job market. We saw this with Enron. People were specifically investing their 401ks in Enron stock. That went to zero, and they got fired. They lost their life savings and their career. It's too much risk concentrated in one company. Diversification helps. OK, let's get back to the offer talk. Um, so at this point, they're making you an offer. And you like the company. You legitimately want to work there. The offer is within the range that you're looking for and you're happy, you're probably going to go ahead and accept it. Do not accept a job offer on the spot. When you say, here's the, we're going to make you an offer, here's the, here's the employment contract, it should seem reasonably, uh, it, should find, it should find it standard, and the response is, sure, do you want me to sign it right now? Well, to be honest, I'd kind of like to rethink giving it to you just now, because frankly, I, sudden, I thought you had good judgment. It, it doesn't send a positive signal. Sleep on it. I don't care if they're offering you $500 million a year and a company helicopter to do whatever you want. Sleep on it. And you're good, so you're going to accept the offer because you don't want to rock the boat. And let's be honest, you suck at negotiating. That's what the quiet voice in the back of your head named imposter syndrome keeps telling you. You're not good at it, you'll just upset people. And I get that, it's hard. But what you do when you receive the offer is going to be the most money per hour you ever make in your life. 
The problem as well, when I was putting this talk together, is that originally, when I gave this talk a few years ago, I built everything on a level of what, was, what worked for me. Turns out that as a straight white guy in tech, I have things that work for me that do not work for other people because we have serious cultural problems. So I had to go back and forth with a number of people to come up with a reasonable way, next step that works for the general case for everyone who is not, does not necessarily look like me. And a lot of times, people are also very difficult with, as far as being able to muster up the courage, for lack of a better term, to ask for more money, because that's a difficult conversation. So don't. Respond, tell them you want to think about it, give it a day, and then send them an email. Thank them for the opportunity. Tell them how much you enjoyed meeting people there. Call them by name, etc. And include a paragraph. This breaks my seven words on a slide rule, but it was important enough to do it. Specifically, something like this or near to it is going to work in almost every case. And I have never seen a paragraph like that make things worse. Because the absolute worst case response is going to be, sorry, that's the best we can do. A reasonable approach is I'm starting to see offers that are a bit higher. And, for, and depending on the numbers, they're going to change the percentages a bit. If someone offers you, let's say, 120, and you wind up coming back with, well, I'm seeing offers in the 130 to 140 range right now. I really would prefer to work for you can you at least meet me somewhere to help make sure I'm not leaving money on the table? Last week, I drafted a paragraph very similar to this for a friend of mine. They instantly bumped the offer 10 grand. He was about to accept. I said, just, just try it. You're not going to piss anyone off. And frankly, if you send a paragraph like this and they turn you down, congratulations, you dodged a bullet. You don't want to work there. You can tell a lot about a company by how they buy their people. If they start smacking you around about money, it doesn't get better from here. I'm still Quinny Pig. Please go ahead and write that down because this talk was not free. You owe me two things. Uh, the first is if any of this helps you at some point, the next time you change jobs, reach out and let me know. I want to make sure that I'm not giving people completely crap advice. I don't think I am, but data help. The second thing is, is you've got to pass this on. Every successful person you will ever meet is there because someone else wound up in a position to reach out and help them. And you can never repay people for that. You can only pay it forward. So some of the most successful people are the ones that want to help. Jill has also graciously offered to talk from a recruiting perspective with anyone who wants to reach out to her as well. We are, people are always thrilled to help other people come up. Money is not a zero-sum game. If I make more money, that doesn't mean there's less for other people. It means that we can all wind up being better off for it. So, this is only a 25-minute slot, and I'm about out of time, but please feel free to tweet questions at me as well. I will do a Q&A on Twitter for as long as people ask me things. I am absolutely thrilled to have these conversations in the hallway as well. There might be an open spaces session around some of this stuff. Let me know. I'm Corey Quinn. I'm delightful, and thank you for listening to me.